Don't you just love people who stick with a project? People who persevere and don't give up no matter what the odds. We love stories, for instance, about athletes who walk onto the team, unscholarship, just want a chance to play, and they work hard for a chance to finally get on the team, and they stick with it until their work is rewarded. It's the stuff that legends are made out of. If you don't try, try again until you succeed, and then you're bound to fail if you don't do that. But if you keep at it and work hard and hang in there, good things are going to happen. That's the way we tend to think in America. The Bible is full of examples of folks who stick with it, from Jacob having a wrestling match with an angel on the river Jabbok, who refuses to let that stronger opponent go until he receives a blessing, all the way through to Paul, who in spite of being imprisoned and stoned and flogged and beaten and shipwrecked, having to endure hunger and thirst and nakedness and rejection, went to all the known world and preached the gospel and finished the job that Christ had called him to do. The gospel today seems to remind us again of the link between working hard and getting a blessing, between doggedness and determination and achieving your goal. The story begins with Jesus challenging his disciples to pray always and to not lose heart. And he tells the story about a widow who wouldn't give up until she got what she wanted from an unjust judge who just didn't seem to care. And Jesus finishes the story by saying, And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him night and day? So the lesson seems clear. Just keep on knocking and you'll be blessed. But you know, I'm not exactly sure that's what this story is telling us. In fact, I think that Jesus was trying to tell his disciples Something entirely different. <laughs> See, we believe in a God of grace. We believe in a God who freely gives us what we need. Over and over again, Jesus says, I have not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners. And over and over again, we're told by Jesus and by Peter and by Paul and other writers in the New Testament that Jesus went to the cross for us, that he died for us while we were still sinners, even at the same time that we were his enemies. And if you boil down all of that good news through the pages of Scripture and get down to its basic meaning, it's this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift from God. That's what this book is all about. So can Jesus possibly be saying that if we work at praying hard enough, if we just hang in there and pester God without letting up, then God will eventually roll over and give us what we want? If that's what the story means, then the gospel is just a matter of works and it makes the idea of God loving and giving look kind of silly. If we boil the gospel down to a matter of works, it lays guilt trips on some people and gives other people a reason to be proud. If you try hard enough, God will give you stuff. See what I have? Or if you don't try hard enough, God won't listen to you and you won't get what you want or need. Is, is that what we believe? How can we say that and look one another in the eye? How can you tell a person who is suffering from cancer, you know, looks like you just haven't prayed hard enough. How can we suggest to the person who's lost a loved one, you know, if you prayed to God every day, this wouldn't have happened? And how can we stomach the person who suggests that everything they have is because they worked hard and they just kept praying to God until they got it? Hang in there and work hard and you'll be blessed is not the gospel. Commitment and hard work can take us places in this world, but that's not the good news that we celebrate here week by week. There's another gospel story about the man who goes to his neighbor at midnight to borrow food because he's had company that have shown up in the middle of the night. And the punchline of that story comes when Jesus says that the neighbor will get up and give the man some bread 
not because he's a friend, but because the man just hangs in there and keeps on knocking at the door. And think of today's story and its punchline, how the unjust judge says, though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. Seems like both stories have that lesson that says, hang in there and you'll be blessed. But as the coach on TV says, not so fast, my friend. The truth is that these stories are told to draw a contrast, a contrast between God and the reluctant neighbor, between God and that uncaring judge. And Jesus seems to be saying that if a corrupt and unjust judge will give justice, simply because the plaintiff is so insistent. How much more is God who loves us? How much more is God who is concerned about us, willing to answer us when we call? And that brings us to the point of the parable. The reason that Jesus tells this story is found in the words that the story opens and closes with. The opening line that Jesus Luke writes, then Jesus told them a parable, a story about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. And the closing line is, I tell you, God will quickly grant justice to those who cry to him day and night. And yet when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Jesus calls us to have faith, to trust that God and God's goodness will bring about the justice we all want and that the blessings will come, and that God, that God is doggedly determined not to give up on us. That's God's gift to us, and that we should continue to pray until these things happen. It's a matter of timing. I came across a story that seems to fit the upper Midwest in the middle of harvest time, but I think you get the point. It talks about how we often confuse God's timing with our own. A newspaper editor had been running a series of articles that talked about how important it was to attend church. And one day, a letter to the editor was received and it read, you can print this if you dare. I'm trying an experiment. I have a field of corn, which I plowed on Sunday. I planted it on Sunday. I did all the cultivating of that field on Sunday. I gathered the harvest on Sunday and I augured it into the bin on a Sunday. And my yield this October is just as great as any of my neighbors who went to church on Sunday. So, where was God all this time? Well, the editor printed the letter, but then he added his reply to the body. He said, your mistake, my friend, was in thinking that God always settles accounts in October. <laughs> Isn't that the mistake that we often make? thinking that God should act when and how we want God to act, according to our timetable, according to our wishes, when the truth is that we can't figure everything out and we just don't have the answers to all the questions. We know that bad things do happen. And sometimes it seems to us that God doesn't care, that God doesn't make a difference in our lives, that justice won't be done, that evil will win out, that death will have the last word, and that's why Jesus says we should always pray and not lose heart. That's why he asks, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Being determined in prayer is what faithfulness is all about. It means continuing to trust God, to act in God's way and in God's time. It might seem that we're alone. It might look like God doesn't hear us, that injustice and evil are winning, but faith challenges us to keep on praying, to believe even when we can't see, and then to let that belief make a difference in our lives. That's what makes people of faith different than other people. People of faith are willing to live by what they can't see, but believe is real, instead of living by what they can see and what the world tells them is real. Polls would tell us that almost everyone prays. They pray when they're in a jam and they're desperate because they can't come up with a fast solution with their problems. They pray because they have an incurable disease. They pray because they can't figure a way out of their mess themselves. And when they don't get the answer they expect, 
and get that answer when they expect it, then they stop praying and start asking why. <coughs> That's not faith. That's not faithful living, and it's not what Jesus calls us to do. Jesus calls us to pray always and not lose heart because God has a blessing in mind for us. God has promised to stand by us and to save us. God has promised a new heaven and a new earth and to save and deliver those who trust, those who have faith. Again, that's what this book is all about. So the real lesson of today's gospel is not hang in there and you'll get a blessing. And we know that. The real lesson is found in our reaction to the world around us. Even when that world is dangerous and crazy, even when nothing else makes sense. Do we trust God? Do we believe? Do we pray always and not lose heart? Or do we see this world as really all there is and only go to God when we can't do anything else and then abandon God when things aren't happening the way we think they should? At what point in your life will you let go of your fears and your frustrations and your impatience, your anger, and start trusting in God's timing and God's way of working? That's what the parable is all about. And at what point in your life do you stop asking why and start asking, Lord, how do I fit into your plan for me? God calls us to pray for and to look for and to expect God's will to be done even during those times when it doesn't seem to us that anything is happening. When the Son of Man comes, Jesus asks, Will he find faith on earth? That's the question this parable asks of each one of us. It's a question that begs us to take a look at our prayer life, to look at our stewardship of life, to look at the way that we use all of those gifts, time, talent, and treasure that God has given to us, to look and see how God's joy shines through. It's about all of that. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in your life? Let's pray. Lord, we turn our attention to your word and find ourselves challenged. Find ourselves maybe backpedaling. Find ourselves asking questions. And yet, through all of that, you are there for us, opening our eyes, expanding our vision of ministry and of response to you. May that challenge never lift. May we continue to push us, push us and prod us to understand and to see new ways that your love can be revealed in this world and the true world. Speak through us and shine through us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.